Okay, so we continue with our laws of Mashiach from the Rambam. Um, just before we go further, I, I mentioned last time, I misspoke. There was, I said there was three things that the Jews had to do when they, went, when they entered Eretz Yisrael the first time, and they had to do it in order that was the halacha. So the three things are, I, I misspoke last time, the three things were, I should say, appointing a king, fighting a malik, and building the temple. I think I got it right this time. And those can parallel the, that w- the order that which the Rambam wrote, if we're going to take that it has to be in that order. First, a king has to arise like his father David, who is a Torah king and therefore follows Torah law. Then he's got to wage the battles of God, if we take the battles of God to mean literally battles, and not battles of halacha, but actual battles, and that would parallel Sorry? Where, where should we be reading from? Oh, yes. Okay, that comes afterwards, it's true. Anyway, so, yeah, if you take it literally, then that parallels fighting on Malik. And then comes uh, the Beis HaMikdash with ingathering and serving the temple. So it would parallel, if the order of that which Mashiach has to do, would parallel the order of that which the Jews had to do when they first entered the land of Israel. Anyway, so as mentioned last time, we were learning um, the halakhic definition of, of what Mashiach is obligated to do, and it did not include miracles. And we cited from history the story of Bar Kokhba, in that in the Rambam's view, Rabbi Kiva, and all of the other sages felt and believed that Bar Kokhba was Mashiach, and it would seem from the Rambam that they were right up until the point that they, that they were wrong. Because there's a process the Mashiach goes through, and at one point he's presumed Mashiach, then he's actual Mashiach, and then he has his jobs as Mashiach. And watching Bar Kokhba go through that program, they thought he was Mashiach at some point, and then at one point when they realized he died, he was, he's not Mashiach. So this is the Rambam discussing genuine, I don't want to use the word failures, but genuine um, attempts at being Mashiach. How are we going to know if he's, when the Mashiach comes? So this is what the Rambam is telling us. You see somebody, that's, that's exactly what the Rambam is telling us. You see somebody who's successful in compelling all Jews to follow Torah, you know he's heading in that direction. You see someone successful in doing that, successful in defending the borders of the land of Israel, successful in building the temple, successful in bringing Jews back to Israel, now you know he's definitely Mashiach. That's what I'm exactly telling us. You watch him do this program and you know he's Mashiach. It's precisely why the Rambam is telling us he's lost. Is he going to come as a grown-up or he's going to, he's going to be a kid who just... No, it's a grown-up a kid. He's a full-on king. That's what I'm saying. We have to think of the, Rambam, of the halachic definition of Mashiach, not the midrashic, um, you know, stories about Mashiach, which are either literal or not literal, or what they mean and how they mean. Here we're talking about the legal definition. So it's a very specific legal definition. He has to do X, Y, and Z. And if he does it, then he's Mashiach. If not... Right. So the Rambam dealt with, and that was, that's what we learned last time, was um, legitimate attempts, genuine attempts at being the Mashiach and believing in those in Mashiach. Because the Rambam does not insinuate in any way that Rabbi Kiva was wrong. In no way does the Rambam insinuate that Rabbi Kiva was mistaken. It's more, you know, they were hoping or they thought and then they realized he, as soon as he, was, he died for because of his sin. So he died, or he was killed by the Romans, actually more accurately, the Rambam writes. Given Shinera, Bavanoisa, once they saw that he was killed because of his sins, they knew he's not Mashiach anymore. In the un- Sorry? No. The, 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 and there's the key. He was killed because of his sins. He was killed because of his sins. If, he didn't, if it wasn't those two things, killed because of sins, I can't tell you what the law would be. But clearly, if a person's killed because of his sins, he's not. Meaning, what if he dies of natural death and not because of his sins? It doesn't say, it doesn't say what, what your view of that is. So I don't know. But in this case, the person was killed because of his sins. And that's the Rambam discussing legitimate attempts 
at being Mashiach or following a Mashiach. In the uncensored version, which we didn't have last time, the Rambam deals with just straight up false attempts at being the Mashiach. One very famous one. Jewish boy. Okay. Okay, that's, that's, that's what he discusses uh, the Rambam. That's not what he discusses about Kochba, though. No, in general. In general, yes. In Lai if he wasn't successful. Even if he was likely when he come back. Right. He says he wasn't successful or would kill. doesn't mention if he died, and that's kind of to Robert's question. There's no problem that he may come back later. Yeah. He's not successful in his attempt. Right. So I said that when he... That's when, he's, when he disqualifies Bar Kokhba, there's two specific things. He died because of sin. Okay, so let's see what the Rambam writes about just fail, false attempts at the Mashiach. And this is, it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing. And I think, uh, you know, as we live today and get closer to the era of Mashiach, these words become much more clear. So... Um, you see the little star where it says, there's like little footnote 27. Right after that, there's like a line. That's where we are. See it? Right-hand column. There's a footnote 27. Period, a line, and then the words afterward. Af. Second to last word on the line. Oh, the, the, the line before we didn't have either? Oh, you're right. Yeah. That's true. That was out. So it says like this. Yeah. So back up, you're right, we did not do those lines. Three lines up. He's talking about those who, well, actually even before that, we didn't have that. So look up Vaharei. So this person, who was a legitimate attempt at Mashiach, but wasn't successful, or was killed, then this person would be on the list of every uh, good and proper king who led the Jewish people in a proper way, because this is a person who, at least in his lifetime, attempted to restore Torah law amongst, Jewish, amongst the Jewish people, to inspire the Jews to follow Torah, the Chazik Bitka, to strengthen the breaches of Jewish, Torah, of Jewish observance. So certainly he's in the Hall of Fame of great Jewish kings, but he passed on. It doesn't say what they say about themselves. Maybe they indeed were tempting to be. It doesn't say not. It doesn't say that he didn't make a comment on what they thought about themselves. Just on what they did. I'm going to make a comment at the end about this idea that they're, he's like, that, that they're like all the other kings. Does that mean that what they did was a waste of time? God forbid. But as we learned in Gemara and Sanhedrin, every king in every stage was part, is, is part of the process that slowly leads to the Mashiach's coming. So it's not as if uh, King David is a failed attempt at Mashiach, God forbid. He's the first, or he's a step, and if he's the first step, the first step probably goes back to Moshe Rabbeinu, and probably before that goes back to creation. But he's certainly a step towards the process of coming to Mashiach as someone like King David, and likewise, any other king that comes forward, or Chizkiah, no, we learned about Chizkiah, uh, Melech, right? The, the Sanhedrin told us that had Chizkiah sang songs to Hashem, he would have been Mashiach. Right, so the Gemara told us about King Chizkiah. Right, and we learned then that it's not as if he was an attempt, failed, off. But what he did, and what he taught, and the way he led is part of the process of leading the Jewish people towards Mashiach's coming. One long process that begins at creation and culminates with Mashiach's coming. And the same thing would be true of someone of this nature. And in that sense, as we talked about, we learned on Hadin, every Jew, every Jew who himself uh, dedicates himself to the cause of restoring Torah observance, and certainly if he's on a mission to share it with others, and that person is part and parcel of the process of Mashiach's coming, even if he isn't the legal Mashiach, as it were. Okay. So the Rambam continues, And these people, these attempts at Mashiach, are only there to test the public. You know, it's to put the public onto a right path. There will be those who will fail. It's all to purify, to clarify, 
Ades Kate, till that time shall come, because there's another time and another occasion when the Mashiach will come. But until then, all these people coming along are still there to help the people get better and move the world in that direction. Sorry? Right, like Hashem testing Gakiva after his Mashiach fail, after his Mashiach fails, does he still is he still faithful to Hashem? And of course he was. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now we get to the part we've been waiting for here. The Rambam's discussion, the censored discussion on failed and false messiahs. Now I'm going to take this. He's pretty explicit. Af Yeshu Hanatsui. As well, JC of Nazareth. Shadim Mashiach Mashiach. He claimed himself to be Mashiach. This is the first time Ramam describes someone who's talking about himself, like you, like you mentioned. The other people mentioned before, the Ramam does not say, doesn't say Bar Kokhba declared himself Mashiach. The Ravid said that. The Ramam did not say that Bar Kokhba declared himself Mashiach, nor does when he comments about other people who are kings, who are working hard to bring Jews back and aren't successful in the end, he doesn't say they thought they were Mashiach. He makes a statement on what we should think, that we should assume that they are presumed Mashiach. But here when he introduces JC, he says he thought he was Mashiach, nobody else did. Right? And then Rambam writes, when Nerag Bebezdin, he was killed in Bethdin. There are obviously other accounts to the history of this, but this is the Rambam's version of the history. He was killed in Bethdin. Or Bethdin condemned him, and he was killed by the Romans. But Bethdin, con- the Bethdin, condemned him for being a false Mashiach. For being a false Mashiach. Sorry. Yeah, no, they condemned him to death. The, whether he act- whether they actually uh, you, whether they actually held the blade is a different story. But here, the Rambam's words literally are: he was killed in, Beth- in Bethdin. So says the Rambam. Don't get so um, caught up. So there's nothing, no new information here. Quran is not born at Daniel. Daniel already prophesied something like this will happen. Shinemar is the verse reads in Daniel. And the people of your, of your nation who uh, break boundaries, meaning they, they stray from the rules. He's going to try to set forth a vision. And he's going to be a big failure. So Daniel already prophesied there's going to be a, fa- a false messiah, from a, Jew, from a Jewish false messiah. And he's going to fail. Now that Rambam specifies what he means, that JC was a failure. The Chiyesh Mikhsha Gadamizah is the greater failure or stumbling block than this. Shekola Neviyim, all the prophets, Dibru, Dibru, when they described the Messianic era, they described it as such. Shah Mashiach, Goyal Yisrael, that Mashiach is going to redeem the Jewish people. Mashiach and save them. Mekabetitchem and gather in their dispersed people. They're talking about the Jewish people. Umachazik mitzvahsan. And going to strengthen their observance of Torah and mitzvahs. We just finished describing in the last three halachas the halachic definition of Mashiach. The halachic definition of Mashiach as we described it is the restoration of Torah law. That's the essence of what Mashiach is. Bringing us to a state when we can fully, completely, and wholly serve Hashem with the temple, with the Israel, and all the rest of it. The Zen, this guy, JC did the exact opposite. Karim la Abad Yisrael Becherev caused thousands, thousands, and at this point probably millions of Jews to die at the sword. Lufaza Sherisim Lashpilam and the Jewish remnant that survived the, the sword of, of the church were scattered throughout who knows where and uh, uh, oppressed. Ulahach Lufatayra and caused Torah to be changed. No, this whole new religion says the old Torah is out. It's the exact opposite of what Mashiach is supposed to do. Mashiach is supposed to come and bring peace to the world, bring the people back, bring the Jewish people back to the land of Israel, restore Torah observance, and this whole religion did the exact opposite. Scattered Jews to farther reaches of the world, oppressed them, killed them, and the ones who were left uh, were, were uh, not just oppressed physically, but spiritually also. They were told that this, this, your Torah out, there's a new one. The exact opposite of everything that Mashiach prophesies about. And this was happening during the lifetime of, of the Rambam? The Ram- well, JC came much before. Right? JC came even before Muhammad. 
And the Rambam comes after Muhammad. Sorry? JC. Yeah. Right. Muhammad comes somewhere, I think, uh, 900 years ago, maybe. No, the year 900 or something. Muhammad. 600, so even earlier. And Rambam comes uh, something like 800 years ago. Sorry? 11. Right? But the truth is that the Rambam himself, uh, sorry? 32. There's two versions to, to the date of his birth, right? Two opinions, 32 or 35. Anyway, so the Rambam himself experienced depression from the Christians and from the Muslims, actually. First of all, as you mentioned in your talk on Wednesday night here, the Rambam ran away from, Span from Spain because the radical Muslims took over. But then later, when the Rambam arrived in, he went through Fez, Morocco, and then went through uh, Israel for a while, and in Israel he ran into the Crusaders which is why he left Israel and went to Egypt. Even though, obviously, he knew that he was in violation of a Torah command not to dwell in Egypt. And yet he did it anyway because it was the only place to survive. So he had first-hand experience of what he's writing here. Both Islamic and Christian oppression. Although the uh, sultans in Egypt were very nice to him. But earlier in his life he had problems with that. Okay. So the point he's making here is, is that the notion of, of uh, JC being a genuine messianic attempt is so preposterous that it flies in the face of the entire definition of what Mashiach is. It's a very um, clever debate tactic, if you will, from the Rambam. Excuse me. In that, often, you hear people get, in, get into the weeds of this verse said that, and did the verse mean this, did the verse mean that. Let's back up a second. Let's zoom out, and let's look at the whole forest. Can you please describe to me the overarching theme of what Mashiach is? Two things. B, Jews living safe in their land. B, serve Hashem happily. JC did the exact opposite. Jews running from country to country, being murdered and slaughtered, being cast around everywhere, and at this, while at the same time, completely undermining Jewish observance. And, and then to tell me that you found one verse that uh, you might have misunderstood to mean this, and that's, that's your proof that he's the Messiah? It flies in the face of the whole narrative. That's the point that I'm making here. I don't know. I'm not a Christian theologian. I don't know. But this is what the Rambam is telling us. <laughs> but it's, it's contradictory. It's contradictory because you want to claim that you want to claim that at, that now we're changing it and the old book no longer applies. Then don't start quoting the old book to tell me that it's, that insinuates your arrival. So you so you take five, take one two verses that you misinterpret to mean it means you, but the rest of the book you throw out. So I'm saying it's 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 inherently contradictory. But anyway, we're not we're not going down that rabbit hole now. So the Ram continues. Not only did he uh, replace Torah and cause Jewish oppression, but lahat he fooled the majority of the world. I shouldn't say the word fooled. Uh, misled. That's the right word. Thank you. Lavid lekamibal Hashem to serve a God other than the one God. We declare Shema Yisrael Hashem Elkeinu Hashem Echad. He or Israel, God is one. That is the declaration of our faith. And he came along and said, no, three, four, five. That's right. Let's see back to where he's going. Now the question becomes, so what was the point? What was the point? Especially if we're reading it the way we explained earlier, that if we're going to, especially if we're going to go with the way Hasidus explains it, we mentioned this a few classes ago, that from a halachic perspective, you don't, you're not compelled to say this, but even though it would be, it would make sense to understand this even in halacha, in that the Mashiach's coming isn't just the reward that God gives us when he's so fit, but rather the culmination of everything we're doing. Right? The, the rabbi talked about this on Shabbos. This is why the Ramam put the halachas at the end of Mashiach. The, the laws of a sheikh at the end of his book of halachas. What he's telling you is, this is the conclusion of all of this. 
all the halachas we said in the last 14 books all lead to this point. Now, if that's the way we understand world history, then this seems to be a huge setback. So what was the point? What was the point of this? And it's interesting that in the Book of Laws, everyone feels it important to address that. I Meaning from Jewish law, what's the difference if I have the answer to the question or not? If Jewish law is merely about do this, don't do that, then what, what information am I finding out here? What information is everyone telling me in terms of do and don't right now, telling me that uh, JC was a failure? There's no new information, there's no uh, instruction, and yet it's in his Book of Laws. What that means is he's giving us a, qualific- a halakhically qualified version of history. How does halakha look at history? Even secular history, not just Jewish history. Christian history. Halakha looks at history as a long process to the Mashiach's coming. And that's what he's about to explain. Aval bat machshavas The thoughts and the plan of our Creator it is incomprehensible for man to fully understand them. That's first of all. So don't think you have it figured out. It's just not possible. Our ways are not his ways. And his, our thoughts are not his thoughts. This is a quote from a verse. And so first of all, don't try to think you understand why, why, why we were subject to all this kind of oppression. You're not going to figure it out. But you should know the following. And all of these things with J.C. of Nazareth, the Zeha Yishma Elish or the and this Ishmaelite that arrived after him, who would that be? Who? Muhammad. Einon Ela Liyasha Derech Lemelech Mashiach. How God does this and why God does this, I don't know. But this is the fact, says the Rambam. Their arrival paves the path for Mashiach's eventual coming, the genuine Mashiach's coming. And they were sent to the world to bring to to uh, bring the world closer to serving one God. Shemar as the verse reads, with respect to Mashiach's coming, for then God says, I will transform all the nations to a pure language, and they will all call out to God and to serve him in one in one unit. So Kate said, how does this work? How does JC of Nazareth and Muhammad bring us closer to the Mashiach's coming and bring the world to serving Hashem? How so? Well, let's think of what happened before they came around. Before JC and Muhammad, the only people in the world that were serving a singular, a monotheistic God was Jewish people. That's one of the reasons when the Greeks came to Jerusalem under Alexander, why the Jews are such an enigma. One second. You know, th- when they came to like all countries and they saw that this, these people have that, this God, they have that God, it was like, okay, fine. So we have our eight gods and this is, they have their nine gods. Okay, so we'll, we'll battle out and see which gods are greater. And then they come to, Jer- to Jerusalem and they find out eight gods, one God. Oh, and he's your God also. It's not as if like we have our God in our country and you have your God in your country and we're going to try to fight it out. That's the way the Greeks looked at these things. Right? That every, and in a way they're right, right? Because the, the Gemara discusses that every, we, we learned about this in the Gemara Yuma, every country has their Sar Lamaila, they have their, they have their angel in heaven, and their angels in heaven, uh, you know, fight in, fight in God's court over who's going to get what. So that was the height of their understanding of spirituality. We have our God, you have your God, and let's fight battle it out. And then they come to Israel, and Jerusalem, they're told, no, 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 no. There is only one God, and he's yours also. This flies in the face of everything that they understood to be correct about spirituality. But now at the arrival of, of uh, Muhammad and JC, monotheism is an accepted way of looking at the world. And in, in, a, in a way, Muhammad went a step forward than JC. Because in, with JC, you still have a trinity. It's not a true unity of God. Whereas with Muhammad, it's full-on monotheism. To the point that the Rambam rules that you could not walk into a church because it's partially idol worship. It's not exactly idol worship, but it's called shituf, which means that you believe that God has partners. That's the church belief. There's God and he has partners, two other partners. But a true believing Muslim believes in one singular God, and therefore you can walk into a mosque, no problem. Not for safety reasons. 
No statutes. No statutes. They don't believe in any phys- they do not believe in the in the whole in the godly in the uh, they don't believe in anything physical becoming a god, unlike the Christians which do. But the Muslims believe in one singular monotheistic omnipresent God. So in that sense, they were successful in bringing a Jewish idea to the god- godly idea to the farther which is the farthest reaches of the world. It's corrupted, and therefore it has to be fixed. But nonetheless, at its root, the message they're spreading is a Jewish idea. That's what he explains here. So, thanks to JC and, and Muhammad, the whole world's talking about a Messiah. And everybody's talking about Torah, and mitzvahs, and from mitzvahs. They're all talking about Torah and mitzvahs. They're arguing about whether or not Torah is right or not right, but they're all talking about Torah. In other words, everybody talks about the Bible. Whether they're misunderstanding the Bible or misinterpreting the Bible is question two. But question A here is that they're talking about the Bible. No one was talking about the Bible in times of the Greeks except for the Jews. And these things, Torah, Mitzvah, the idea of Messiah, the idea of a God-given word, a universal God-given message that was brought to the furthest reaches of the world. And to many nations who are you know, uncircumcised of heart. I mean, they were closed to this idea of monotheism. Now they're open to it. They have noised the Middle Eastern Torah. Now they're discussing and arguing about this. Of mitzvahs of Torah, and they're arguing about the mitzvahs of Torah. Elo ayim mitzvahs elo elo emesayu. These, the Christians say that they were the Torah was true. The Karbat was manazeb, but now Torah is not true anymore. The loyal yonoi goes to daris, and Torah wasn't meant to be done forever. The elo ayim dvar mistarim yesh ben vein kavshutam. But the Muslims say that there is deep messages in Torah, but it's not literal. No, they're all arguing about Torah. And they all agree that the Bible at its core is a godly divine book, a universal godly message. Just that the Christians say it changed, and the Muslims say it has a metaphor, not literal, but they're all agreeing that it's, that it's genuine and true and real and godly. And they say, and Messiah already came and revealed their secrets. So the conversation has been opened, thanks to these people. And therefore, and therefore, when the true Melech Mashiach comes, when the true Mashiach comes, and he'll be successful, be elevated and exalted. So all, gonna, all of them are going to come and say, ah, this is what we're looking at the whole time. And everything we thought till now was a mistake. And that our prophets and our forefathers misled us. But this is what we were looking for the whole time. So it's a very, very interesting Two sides to the coin, as Alan's telling us, the way we look at, at uh, Jewish, at world history. On the one hand, you have to understand what's right and what's wrong. So the first thing he tells you is that JC was the biggest failure ever. It's the first thing. Caused destruction, caused oppression, caused the replacement of Torah. So don't get any, don't get any illusions that because I'm telling you he led the way to Mashiach, that somehow this is a holy person. God forbid. This is a terrible person who did terrible stuff and caused endless destruction to the Jewish people. Now, why God did it that way, I don't know, says the Rambam. I'm not God. I cannot tell you why God chose to do it this way. But I can tell you the fact. The fact is that this corruption, this horrible, terrible corruption, at the end of the day, is going to lead to the ultimate time era of Mashiach's coming. And all this is stated in the Halacha. In Jewish law, this is not a book of Jewish uh, theology or philosophy. He could have kept this for the Mary Nebuchadnezzar, for his book of philosophy, the, the Guide to the Perplexed. But he put it in Torah in Jewish law. He's telling you how halacha looks at history. It's not as if halacha, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. It's not as if halacha... It is a halacha. It is a halacha. In other words, halacha is not just do and don't. That would have been already a big enough feat. Halacha is not only here's what we believe and here's what we don't believe. Right? The Rambam was the first one that was mentioned in the free classes, our first class. The Rambam was the first one to... Uh, you know, legally defined theology. Here is the legal definition of God. Here is the legal definition of reward. Here is the legal definition of punishment. Here is the legal definition of Mashiach. Things that were relegated to theology. The Rambam made it a halachic question. Now he's adding a whole other dimension. The halachic view of history. Halachic view of Jewish suffering. That all of it is to lead us to the ultimate purpose for Mashiach's coming. And today, in our world today, especially in the West, 
where a lot of the oppressive parts of at least Christianity have fallen away. Right? The, the oppressive parts of Christianity, thank God, for the most part, at least here in the West, are, are, are no longer. The oppressive elements of Islam are unfortunately still around. And Hashem will take care of that when, when He sees fit, hopefully sooner rather than later. But the reality is that, the, that in the West, where we live, the oppressive elements of Christianity are, are gone. And we, today here in the West, can speak about the Bible, can speak about Torah as a godly thing, and you're, no one would flinch your bad an eyelid. Like, oh yeah, you're talking about that, that, that Torah thing. Yeah, okay. You know what you're talking about. And they're open and willing to listen. And it's because of the last 2,000 years of corrupted Christianity. So today, an unassuming non-Jewish person whose great-grandfather may have oppressed my great-grandfather, right? but he's uh, just a regular guy, if I talk to him about Torah, he's open to hearing. Today we're living what he's describing here. And again, this is in halacha. That the way halacha looks at history, the way halacha looks at Jewish oppression, the way halacha looks at everything that ever happened, whether we understand why and how, another question. But the fact remains that from the halachic perspective, everything that happened is eventually to lead us to the culminating time when Mashiach comes. So this ends chapter 1, or the first chapter of the two chapters that I'm going to describe Mashiach, chapter 11 of the, book, of the section of Kings. And essentially what we describe here is the halachic definition of the Mashiach, the man, what his obligations are, what he is going to do, what he's not going to do, what failed Mashiachs look like, what genuine attempts to Mashiach look like, and how they're all part of the process of bringing about Mashiach at the end of days. But now that we understand that it's all part of the process to bring it to the Mashiach at the end of the days that will come very soon, now comes the next chapter, God willing, to begin tomorrow to describe what does the world look like when Mashiach comes. What does the world look like? If the whole world history is to lead to that point, well, what does it look like? Not about the man, Mashiach, what he has to do, but about the world around us, the era. What's the state of world politics? What's the state of world consciousness? That's going to come, God willing, um, tomorrow. Have a wonderful day, everybody.